I'm going to read out of First Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 14. This morning's message, every now and then I kind of like deviate. Typically, like I'll preach a story and use it to bring in some New Testament theology. But every now and then I'll preach one of these letters that was written by the disciples. So it has a little bit of a different feel to it. It's kind of like a little bit more teachy maybe, but it's the Word of God and it's got some good things to say. Amen. I titled this morning's message, Why Are You So Surprised? And when it's all said and done, um, I think that it'll make some sense. Let's look at 1 Peter. We're going to read, like I said, chapter 4, verses 1 through 14. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now, I want you to, I'm going to kind of take a little bit of time every now and then to kind of just explain where we are in the text because I'm going to go back and I'm going to preach from the text and I don't want to go back and read each time whenever we do that. But essentially, he's talking about the fact that Jesus suffered physically through his death when he died on the cross and that the reality of it is, is that you and I in our physical life, now Jesus was without sin and he paid the price for sin, but you and I in our physical flesh have a sinful nature. And therefore, the word, what the idea behind a sinful nature is, it's almost like the factory that produces sin. We have a, I'm not trying to use a whole bunch of big words, but a proclivity or a compulsion to be moved towards a compulsion. Yeah. You're being compelled. Okay, let me give you an illustration. A, a, a horse with a carrot in front of his nose that pushes him. A, a rat trap with a piece of cheese on it. Uh, to, that pushes and draws you towards something that's going to make your flesh feel good. But the truth is, is that for the true believer that's come to a realization of who he is in Christ, at some point in time, that fleshly life is supposed to stop. There's supposed to be the same mindset that was in Christ. Jesus died on the cross. He that's suffered right. in the flesh. And because of what he did, you and I can also cease from living that life according Amen. to the flesh. Amen? Amen? That he, talking about the believer, should no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh of the lust of men. So you're not supposed to continue to live your life that way. Amen. Right? Um, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. That's a whole lot of old English that sometimes it's kind of hard to understand, but... What it means is, is that, you know what, the time that you spent in the world was sufficient enough. You know, you know what I'm getting at? Whatever, whatever you did while you were in the world, however you lived your life, it was sufficient enough the time frame. You already paid your dues to the world. You don't owe the world Amen. anything. You, 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 already, you, you gave yourself to it. And now it's time for you to allow God to, to flip it and, and to move in a new direction. Oh, Amen? He says... Um, for the time past of our life was sufficient for the for having wrought with the will of the Gentiles. We did what the world wanted us to do. That's what it's saying. When we walked in lasciviousness, that just means all kind of lustful, sinful lifestyle. Lust of excessive wine, drank too much. Revelings, that's that same word that we use in the book of Galatians. And that's basically talking about Mardi Gras. I'm telling you, like if you look it up in the Greek, that's Mardi Gras right there. The God of Bacchus, men that revel late at night, stay up all night long, drinking and partying is basically the part the world. The world's party is what it is. OK, we're trying to we're, we're trying to establish and what the word of God will repeatedly do is show us the difference between the children of God and the world, because God is asking his people to live their lives differently. Banquetings and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it's strange that you run not with them. <laughs> Now, that's pretty, that's pretty good right there. You know what I'm saying? Because even though that's old English that was written in like 1611, you can still hear yourself saying so. Why you don't run with us no more, man? It just seems strange to us that you're not running with us anymore. So that word right there continues to live today, right? He says that you that you not, um, they think it's strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot. And then they speak evil of you. One of the things that you're going to learn if you, when you give your heart to the Lord and you begin to turn your back on the way that you used to live, the people that you used to run with aren't always going to like it. Even though they know that you were previously destroying yourself. Yeah. 
who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. Now, I'm not, this doesn't have anything to do with my message, but I'm just trying to make a point. When I always try to talk to y'all about this old English word quick, which means to be alive, and I reference this old cowboy, this not old cowboy movie, but this cowboy movie that had Sharon Stone in it. It plays on TV sometimes. And it was like a bunch of gunfighters, and there was every hour on the hour or whatever, they would have a gunfight. It was like this competition. Everybody showed up in this town. And the title of the book was, the title of the movie was called The Quick and the Dead. That's where they got the title of this book from, from this passage of scripture. But it's an old English word the word quick means alive so so what basically what's going on here is that they're going to give an account to him that is ready to judge those both that are living and those that are dead for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead that they might be judged according to men in the flesh but live according to God in the spirit see you know, the Lord dealt with me one time, and I know I've shared this before, but there was a girl that I used to work with that was a nurse practitioner, and she was extremely intelligent. Like she, I know I know her IQ. If her and I sat down and took an IQ test, she'd be much higher than my IQ. And it's okay. I mean, some people are just smarter than others. But I can remember whenever I would try to have discussions with her about the Lord, and she would reason from her logic and her intellect why that wasn't going to work for her. But yet at the same time, she was pouring her life into every new little fad that would come across. She had Corvettes, and so it, she wanted to be part of the Corvette Club, and when that kind of wore down, she, next thing you know, she wanted to be part of the Orchid Society, and it wasn't good enough just to be part of the Orchid Society, she wanted to be in charge of the Orchid, she had a lack in her life, she had an empty spot in her heart. And I can remember when I would try to talk to her about the Lord. One time I walked out and I'm like, dude, that's a lost cause, that's what I was thinking in my head, that, that girl ain't never going to get saved, and she's still not saved today. But you know, the Lord chastised me. The Lord revealed to me that it's not what his chastisement means. It means to be corrected. We're going to talk to you about the scripture this morning at some point that uses that word, a, a word of correction. The Lord corrected me and he instructed me that it's not my job to determine who's going to get saved and who's not going to get saved. That's why it says that the gospel was preached to them that were dead. Even though people are dead spiritually, it's not our job to decide who's going to be who's going to be able to hear the gospel message because we don't know who God is going to move by his spirit and change them and transform their life. It's his job to do that part. It's our job to be willing to be a believer and to represent him in this lost and dying world. So for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. God wants to give them an opportunity to receive him. Amen. And to have the spirit of life on the inside of them and to live with God. Now we're going to verse seven. This is a new paragraph with a new thought. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Now I'm going to explain this a little bit more, but, the, but Peter's saying, listen, you've got to understand the times that you're living in. We're nearing the end. God's going to wrap this thing up. Now some people would stop and say, hey, this was almost 2,000 years ago. We're still here. Listen, we're talking about time frames. You know, God, listen, I didn't plan on doing this, but let me just say something. God, I, I use this terminology a lot. In my, in my preaching and teaching, I talk about this concept here. Instead of saying history, salvation is his story. And what I mean by that is, is that man chronicles history in a lot of varied ways. Through the rise and fall of empires, through natural disasters. I mean, you can Google something, the fire of San Francisco. And I don't remember what it was, but it was in the 1800s and it almost destroyed the whole city. My point is, is that man has his own way of chronicling history. But God chronicles history through the salvation plan. It's his plan. It's his world. And that's the plan and the, and the history that we should be paying attention to. And the only way that we'll know it is by understanding his word. And, and the point that I'm trying to make it right now is, is that, you know, God's plan starts off and he explains to us that there was a fall. There was a fall of man. Adam and Eve went their own way and they rebelled against God and their rebellion caused a separation between man and God. And because of that also, now man is born really in the image and likeness of his father, Adam. I, you know, I, I'm always careful when I say this kind of thing because 
if you say something different than what people have learned from preachers, they automatically get this flag up that says, well, he's not preaching the truth. But the reality of it is that, you know, that people talk about the fact that we were created in the image and likeness of God. Yes, mankind was created in the image and likeness of God. Adam was created in the image and likeness of God, but then Adam fell. And when Adam fell, he took something into himself that God didn't have. He took sin into himself. And the Bible teaches that Adam, after a certain amount of time, had a son named Seth. And Seth was born in the image and likeness of his father, Adam. And all of us come forth from the loins of Adam, if you will. He's our father in the physical. We were all born of him. Therefore, according to the book of Romans, and we're, we're getting into Romans, by the way. We'll be teaching it again tonight for the next eight weeks. But when we get into Romans chapter, the end of five and chapter six and chapter seven, we're going to learn about this thing called the sinful nature. It's that part of man that he received in his first physical birth from Adam that is the factory that produces sin in the heart and life of people and drives them to go towards things that are ungodly. So now God, now there's a situation on earth because of the fall that man is full of sin and God begins to move forward with salvation, which is his story. I could say so many different things. I could talk about so many different time frames. I could talk about the flood. I don't, I, I don't really have time to spend a whole lot of time. I could talk about Babel. I mean, sin got so bad that the entirety of the world was separated from God. The Bible says that all man was thinking was evil in his heart continually. There's been times that many of us, if we were bad enough in sin, that word lasciviousness, that word lust of the flesh that we talked about, it's whenever sin is raging in your heart and basically you walk around, maybe you haven't been that bad off, but basically a porno movie is going on in your head all day long and you're thinking about nothing but the lust of the flesh, whether it's about that kind of thing or whether it's a, a you know, a constant drive to go towards you know, drugs or alcohol, or you're filled with anger, or you're filled with gossip, or whatever. The Bible says that there was a time when man was so filled with sin that God had to bring judgment upon the world. There was a time when all the men after the flood rebelled against God. They all said, no, come let us make ourselves a city. God wanted mankind to inhabit the whole earth because he had a plan to save Man from every tr tongue, tribe, and nation, but man under the leadership of Nimrod said, no, come let us build ourselves a city. Let us raise up into heaven. And God confused the languages. And you know what he did <laughs> after this? Amen. He called a man named Abraham. See, there was no nation for God at that time. God, if you flip the page from chapter Genesis 11 to chapter 12, what you'll see is, is that after God confused the languages, that's what the word Babel means, the Tower of Babel, they all spoke one language, but, and they were being rebellious against God, and they would not spread over the earth, so God forced them to spread over the earth. He confused their languages. I don't have time to talk about, listen, I've researched this, there have been atheists, linguists, People that study human language that admit that they can see that all languages came from one language. But the reality is, is that these same people don't believe in God. So they're not going to use the Bible and they're, they're not going to give validity to it. But they have even said on multiple occasions that they can see that all languages come from one language. But when God confused the languages, it forced them to divide themselves into different people groups and to spread along the earth, but there was still no nation for God. So when you flip the page, what you, what you learn is, is that God called a man named Abraham out from amongst all of them, and he said, I'm going to make a nation out of you. So because there was no nation that represented God, God created a nation for himself. And to that nation, he gave them his word. And he asked that nation to, to, to reflect his character. And to live for him in the middle of a world that was fallen and separated from him. Amen. Amen. And, you know, I'm just going to fast forward because ultimately from that nation, he gave us Jesus. Yes. Amen. Ultimately from that nation, he gave us Jesus. And now, I'm just saying, like, now he's creating a whole different people group. I'm talking about this is a big old, this is a big Jesus. Amen. And what I'm trying to say is, is that when the gospel goes forth, Aaron got saved, Jesse got saved, 
Robert got saved. Robert got saved. Told somebody else about Jesus. Somebody else got saved. Matt got saved. And every single time, somebody that was previously in the world, I know I talk about this kind of stuff a lot, but you know what? We need to be reminded of it. This is supposed to be people that are broken and dead. People that are born of Adam. People that are born in the world. And then when you hear the gospel message, guess what happens? You're translated into the kingdom of God. You're translated into the kingdom of God and you become part of what's called the body of Christ. Amen. A new life, a new beginning, a new spirit on the inside of you, pushing you and teaching you that your life on earth is supposed to look different than it previously looked. He says, but the end of all things is at hand. See, that's how I got started on this. Because I'm trying to say that there's a long history according to God's story. Thousands and thousands of years of human history. You can believe the scientists if that's what you choose to do, but carbon dating has been proven to be wrong on multiple occasions. I don't have time to have a discussion about creation right now, but what I will say is this. For thousands of years of human history, God has been methodically, slowly revealing His plan and getting us to a place where Jesus would show up on the scene. The Bible teaches us that God always knew before he even created man and put him in the garden that man was going to fall, that sin was going to come in, and that it was going to require Jesus to die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. I don't have time for philosophy either this morning. I really do need to stick to my message. But what I will say is, is that the first question that somebody on the video that's watching, okay, then why would you serve a God? That would create man knowing that man was going to fall and knowing that it was going to cause all of this heartache and all of this pain because God doesn't want robots. Amen. Amen. Sorry. Amen. I mean, I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. That's God. Do you want to be in a relationship with somebody that robotically says, I must love you? No, God doesn't want robots. God gave you a free will and you can either serve him or you don't have to. He, he wants to show his goodness. He wants to show his mercy and his grace. He wants to show his love, but you don't have to believe it. You can choose like the rest of the world not to serve God. He gave you a gift called free will. And what he wants you to do is he wants you to hear the gospel, see that there's something different on, the, on this earth and that it's him. And willing, and now listen, and he's willing to move on your heart by his spirit. He's willing to grasp your mind and grab a hold of your attention and to make himself real to you. Amen. He's willing to do all of that. And, and, and to convince you that he's real. And But he, at some point in time, he wants you to take the free will that he's given to you as a gift. And then to say, yes, God, I want you. Amen. Yes, God, I want you and I want to serve you. And I know that if I'm going to serve you, I'm going to have to learn the truths that contained within this book. And I'm going to, because it's your character that you've revealed to us upon this earth. It's the only thing that we have that reveals your heart to us. It's completely contrary to what the world says we should do. It's in complete opposition to the ways of the world. And we know that your spirit is going to open our eyes to your truth. Yes, God. I give you my heart. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The end of all things is at hand. I said all that to say that. There's been all this time and now we're nearing the end. Yes, it's been 2,000 years, but when you look at it in the grand scheme of things, we're nearing the end. Yes. Peter says that the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Make sure your mind's clear. You know, if you get caught up in, in various types of sin, it's not necessarily talking about taking shots at the bar. It's not necessarily talking about popping pills. You get caught up in any kind of sin and indulge your spiritual senses and you cannot see the things that God wants you to see. You become drunk in the spirit to the point, you know what, you know what I'm thinking? Look, I got, unfortunately, I have a little bit of familiarity with being drunk. I've been drunk, way too drunk, too many times. One of the things that I remember about when I used to get drunk, I'm just saying, like, I couldn't walk right. I didn't hear things right. I couldn't see half the time. I was, we used to think that was funny. Man, dude, I got blind last night. Couldn't see. And sometimes I couldn't really even remember what I had previously done. 
point that I'm trying to make is, is that sin will do that to you in a spiritual sense. Yeah. It'll make you walk in a wrong direction. Yeah. It'll prevent your ears from hearing what God wants you to hear. That's good. It will confuse you to the point where you cannot see things properly. Yeah. Everything's skewed. You open up doors for the enemy to come in and to speak lies to you. I'm just talking about any kind of sin that you let in will begin to cause confusion to your heart. He says you need to be sober and you need to be praying. He says, above all things, have fervent charity. That word charity is a way to say love among yourselves for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. You know, as far as for believers, because that's who he's talking to, we're supposed to love one another. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. <laughs> it's kind of like whenever you give money to the Lord. You know, nobody else can tell you that you're supposed to give money to the Lord. It's got to be something that the Lord reveals to you through His Word. His Word says that He expects His people to pay a tithe. I've taught on that. I'll teach on it again. But at the same time, I'm not over here trying to twist nobody's arm. There's churches in town, I'm telling you, where I have literally had people tell me that they went to a church in town... And one day the pastor pre knocked on the door and he's like, hey, dude, I need to see your W-2 form. Uh -uh. He didn't say it like that, but he uh -uh. said, I need to see your W-2. He didn't call him dude. He's like, because he's way too holy to call somebody dude. I need to see your W-2 form. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you just got to make sure you're paying your proper amount. <laughs> Excuse me? Uh, yeah. Dude, like I think I would have really gotten a flash. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yes. It's not anybody else's business. But it's between you and the Lord on whether you pay your tithe. God is very explicit on how that is to be done. But everybody will justify things in their own mind and figure out how they want to do it. And just they'll do that just like that, just like they'll do with anything else. And they'll and in their heart and in their mind, they'll they'll figure out in their own, you know, in their own ways, they'll justify their own actions. They'll, yeah, but I'm doing this. Yeah, but I'm doing that. Look. All I know is this, the word of God has an answer for that too. And until we're just, we're either going to obey it, believe it. But at the same time, it's not any one person's responsibility. It's not my responsibility, even though I'm the pastor of this church to try to convince somebody that that's the way it's supposed to go. Any more than it's my job as a pastor to convince you in your personal life, other than from what I say from the pulpit, and if you ask me, and whatever the case, of other things that the Bible talks about. Sometimes people just don't want to know. They don't want to hear, nevertheless. But look at this. What I was going to say is, I used I, I even went off into tithing because of the grudging word. Because I can remember when I used to give unto the Lord, I did it grudgingly. I was convinced it was what I was supposed to do, but I wasn't happy about it. And so I had a bad attitude about it. And so I put the money in the bucket, but I wasn't happy about it. And in this scripture, it's talking about giving hospitality one to another, but not grudgingly. What that means is, is that we're supposed to be genuinely kind hearted to one another. Right. But that we're not supposed to do it behind behind the scenes. See, nobody knew that I had a bad attitude when I was putting money in the bucket. It's just me and the Lord. <laughs> And a lot of times we put up, we paint ourselves with a smile on our face. Hey, how you doing? It's good to see you, brothers and sisters. But the reality of it is on the inside, we're not really all that happy to see them. Because we're grudgingly in our heart towards our brothers and sisters. You know what I'll say about that is, is that a lot of times people, uh, people do things that frustrate us. Welcome to the real world. People are going to constantly do things that frustrate you. But the reality of it is this, is that... The Holy Spirit will produce fruit in your life. That's why love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, kindness, gentleness, and meekness are not a fruit of you. <laughs> I mean, the Bible teaches a fruit of the Spirit. And in other words, it's the Holy Spirit that's producing fruit in your life. Instead of lust of the flesh in Galatians, it talks about lust of the flesh, fornication, drunkenness, revelry, anger. All of these things that come out of us that are not of God... Instead, if we will yield, give way to the Holy Spirit, he will produce the fruit of the spirit in our lives. Amen. Love, joy, peace, long suffering, patience, gentleness, kindness. Amen. He said, he goes on to say, as every man has received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. 
If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God gives. Amen. That God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now we're going to verse 12 through 14. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice. Inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. Essentially, what he's saying is, is listen. Whenever you find yourself in trials, and we're going to break it down a little bit more, fiery trials, painful circumstances, situations that don't feel good to you, that you're not to think it's a strange thing, but that instead you should rejoice and that you should understand that just as Jesus suffered because this world wasn't the same as Jesus, that you also, because you're not the same as the world, will also have some sufferings in your life if you're living for Jesus. Serving him, making decisions that look like the Lord, because the glory of God rests upon you. People are not going to like that. There's people in the world that are not going to like the glory of God that rests upon you because it looks different than what they look. Because you make decisions that are different than the decisions that they make. Because his word instructed you in a way that you should go that was different than the way that the world instructed you that you should go. Look at this. If you be reproached or come against for the name of Christ, that was verse 14, happy you should be. You know why? Because the spirit of glory is resting upon you. <clears throat> On their part, he is evil spoken of. You know, people talk bad about Jesus out there. People talk bad about Christians. But on your part, he is glorified. You know, as I was reviewing these, these passages of scripture, I was trying to think about and, and, and try, you know, and understanding what, what basically it was speaking. I was trying to think about an Old Testament text that I could use as an illustration, you know, kind of like reviewing backwards and say, okay, who are some Old Testament characters that things in their life reflect this New Testament passage? The first thing that entered my mind was the story of Daniel and his three friends, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, if you've never heard of them before, Daniel in the lion's den is the story, and then the fiery furnace is the story for the other three boys. Essentially, they were from Jerusalem, and there was a time frame, it was about 526 B.C., that Israel as a nation, <coughs> by the way, God had created this out of Abraham, had created a nation called Israel, I said that, and then ultimately through Israel, he gave us Jesus, but there's a large time frame, this is about 2,000 BC and this is a this is you know if we start at zero it's not really zero but you get the point. There's about a, 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 a probably a thousand year period of the kings. King David is somewhere around a thousand BC and it was about a thousand year period where Israel had a king and they were a nation where they did not live the way that God asked them to live and it progressively worsened. It progressively worsened to the point where in five hundred and 86 BC there was a king from Babylon called Nebuchadnezzar and he came in and he infiltrated them it almost be like if the Russians or the Chinese came in and infiltrated us and now what they did was is that they went to all the parochial schools or all the advanced learning high schools and they grabbed all the smartest of the students that we had and they brought them back over to their land and trained them in their ways that's essentially what they did that's what Daniel Shadrach Meshach and Abednego were they were the, the, the cream of the crop. And they brought him over there to a foreign land. I know that I've talked about this before. I, I Googled it one time to try to figure out how far Jerusalem was from Babylon. And it's about a drive from Homa to San Antonio. So they had to walk that distance. Now, you know, that's, and, and so they basically what I'm trying to say is, is that they were in a foreign land. Jerusalem was their home, but they were taken away to a foreign land called Babylon. For the New Testament believer, the point that I'm trying to make is, is that the Bible talks about a heavenly Jerusalem. 
It's a place where all those that are going to have that have a relationship with God, whether it be Old Testament or New Testament, it's a heavenly Jerusalem in that one day we're going to be reunited with God. That's our home. That's the kingdom of God. Ultimately, is to be with God. But, it, but right now we're on foreign soil. We're, we're in a place like Babylon. And in Babylon, they did things differently. They served different gods. They had a different culture. Their ways were different. They behaved in a different manner. They ate different food. They drank different things. And it was all, the, everything that they did was against the ways of God. And Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew that. And there were two specific occurrences that happened. First, in the three boys' lives, Nebuchadnezzar built a golden statue. And they paraded it around the land. And as they would parade it, they began to play music. And whenever you heard the music, see, there was a decree that had been written, a law that had been written. It says, when you hear the music, this is what you got to do. You got to bow down and you got to worship the image of Nebuchadnezzar. Well, a time came whenever the statue had been paraded, the music began to play, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego just happened to be right there. And, they, and, 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 and every, all of a sudden, everything stops. Wait, hold on a second. Everybody else is bowing. Everybody else is worshiping, but you're not. Why are you not bowing and worshiping the image that we've built? Why are you being, because we don't do what you do. We serve a different God than you serve. Our God won't allow us to bow. See, the world that you and I live in is different than what the kingdom of God looks like. They handle their business different. Their culture's different. They, they think different. They do different stuff. And when you don't do what they do, it brings an offense to them. And now comes persecution. Because they said, no, if you don't do it, what's going to happen is we're going to heat up this fiery furnace. A literal, physical, fiery furnace. And we're going to throw you in there. And ultimately, this is what they said. You can throw us in there if that's what you choose to do. The God that we serve will, can, will deliver us from that fiery furnace. And yet, if he chooses not to, we're still not going to bow. We're not going to do what you want us to do. You can throw us in the fire. We die physically. But guess what? We serve an eternal God. We're not going to sit here on this earth if we're in a temporary moment of time and bow to your ways if they're contrary to the ways of our God. Amen. God delivered them out of that fiery trial. Then in the next story with Daniel, it's so awesome that Daniel through time became a leader in their government. And all the other smaller leaders, I guess we could look at them like councilmen. They weren't really councilmen, but it's kind of like that. The councilmen were very envious of Daniel because he was just, God kept promoting him because he lived his life for the Lord. And even sometimes in the midst of this world, God will promote you as you live for him and serve him. Amen. Have you ever seen that in your own life where God will promote? And it doesn't never happen the way that you expect it to. And along the time, along the framework, there will be times where you'll be frustrated and you'll be irritated. And your flesh will try to convince you, man, this is getting on my nerves. I'm about to quit this thing. Well, you go ahead and quit. You go ahead and quit and run. But guess what? You're going to have another trial down the road. Because you, you are not letting God deal with the problem that is in you. Yeah, so oftentimes we think that the problem is everybody else around us. No, at some point in time, we got to start looking in the mirror and realize we got some issues. We got some things that are going on in us that God's wanting to deal with. He's wanting to get rid of. He's wanting to work on. But what we do is, is that we get frustrated when things don't go our way. We throw a temper tantrum. We have a fit. And we go down the road to the next place. Guess what? You just said that God is not. Listen, God is not mocked. He is not a man that he shall be mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Listen, you're either going to reap. You're either going to sow seed that's going to produce a harvest of righteousness. Or you're going to sow seed that's going to produce a harvest of flesh. Whatever seed you sow, you're about to get you a harvest. And if you keep on running from the will of God, I'm being real practical now. Right now, I'm just talking about a job situation. I'm just talking about a job situation where it ain't all going your way. And so here we have a situation where Daniel, though, is serving the Lord. And he's being promoted in the government. And the councilmen are angry because he's done risen to the top. And they're like, we got to find a way to trap this dude and mess him up. <laughs> Can I tell you that the world's going to probably do that to you? Unfortunately, sometimes you're going to run into Christians... That, that still act like the world and they'll do the same thing to you too. They'll try to get you in trouble. But what ended up happening was they wrote a new law, a new decree, and it was kind of similar to the statute. They said at this time of the day, 
for this period of time, when you bow down, you have to bow down and you have to pray. It was a new king named Darius. You got to pray to him. Can't pray to whoever you were praying to before because the only thing they could find in Daniel's life was that he prayed to his God three times a day at a certain time. And so they, they manufactured the time frames to correspond to when Daniel was doing it. Listen, you know what I like? Go ahead and put this scripture up real quick. Daniel chapter 6 verse 10. I like the way the Bible describes what Daniel did after he heard that they had written that law. It says, now when Daniel knew that the law was signed, the writing was signed. This is what he did. He went into his house with his windows being open in his room toward Jerusalem. He faced. That's what it's saying. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did a four time. He did the same thing that he had always done. They can change the laws and say that you're not going to live the way that God tells you to live. But Daniel said, no, I'm going to continue to do what I know that the word of God tells me that I'm supposed to do in spite of the fact that you don't want me to do it. The end result was Daniel in the lion's den, that Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. So what we have in this story is people of God that are living in a foreign land, Babylon being a type of the world. It connects to you and I because now that we're born again in Christ, we're children of God. Yet at the same time, we live in a foreign land because this land is foreign to the will of God. And whenever we live our lives for God, sometimes we come against opposition. And whenever we come against opposition because we're living our lives differently, it causes them to become frustrated with us and we receive persecution. And many times that persecution will result in a trial of your life. And sometimes there's things going on in our lives because, listen, I'm going to be honest with you. And part of my message is about this. Sometimes there's things in our life that the trial is not so much because of the fact that we're doing everything that we're supposed to be doing for God. Hello. Newsflash. Right. Am, am, am I right here or am I, am I preaching the truth? Hmm. Come on, man. Y'all shake that slumber off of you. <laughs> Am I like Paul? Do you know what the Apostle Paul said? Have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? I'm just here. To, I'm just here. To, look, I'm about to get into it here in a second. I'm about to tell you what I try to do when I get up here. If you speak, speak as though it's the oracles of God. That's what he told him to do. Speak as though it's the word of the living God. Okay, I don't want to get into that right now, but I will say this. Sometimes the fiery trial that we find ourselves in the midst of is not necessarily because we're living our life t t straight up the way that we're supposed to be living our life for the Lord. But that instead we find ourselves in the midst of a situation because God is trying to bring correction to our lives because he loves us to the point where he wants to set us on the straight and narrow. Right. Amen. All right. Got that point out. Now, point number one from my message. Y'all ready? Point number one, after all this that I read and after the story that I told you about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, there should be a recognizable difference between the world and believers. That was in the first part of the passage of 1 Peter that I read. There should be a recognizable difference between the world and believers. Look, whenever that golden statue was being paraded around and the music began to play everybody else was bowed down on the ground there was a recognizable difference between those three hebrew boys and the rest of that crowd they were still standing Amen. up there should be a recognizable difference listen the scripture that we read in the beginning of first peter it talked about the fact that jesus suffered in his flesh so that we could be delivered from our flesh this new life will at times require a painful movement away from our flesh. That's what the word means regarding suffering to experience a painful situation. You know that the crucifying of Christian flesh is not always easy and painless. It's just not. Sometimes we wish that it was, but sometimes our flesh grabs a hold of things on this world that it makes it feel good. Listen, if we didn't have, if our flesh didn't find things that were contrary to the will of God that made us feel good, do you think we'd have a problem letting go of it? <laughs> no, it'd be so easy. All you'd have to do is read it and, and we would hear it and we would respond to it. Sometimes it's painful. But sometimes the result of holding on to it, it ultimately, no, not sometimes, it will lead to death. Pain's better than death. Yes. However, Christians don't live the way 
that they used to live, where they continue to give into their flesh. That's not normal Christianity. You can't continue to give into your flesh. Instead, Christians, this is how we're supposed to live. Look at Colossians 3, 5. It says, mortify, therefore, your members. What do you think that word mortify means? Anybody want to throw something out there? Kill it. Death. Slay it. It's where we get the word mortician. It's a person that works on dead bodies. Mortify, therefore, your members. What's your members? It's your body parts. Your body parts are what bring the sin to you. Your feet bring you places you ought not go. Your ears open up to things you ought not hear. Your eyes open up to things you ought not see. Your hands touch stuff you ought not touch. Your lips drink stuff or smoke stuff or take stuff or whatever that you ought not take. And we just stop right there with the body parts. Point being is, is this, is that our flesh wants to engage in things that are ungodly upon the earth. It, it, it says right here, Paul says, put them to death, which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness. It's just talking about all kinds of sin. All kinds of sin that make your flesh feel good. You need to put it to death. Is it going to hurt? Sometimes it hurts. Sometimes it's painless, but in the end, you're going to be so glad that you put it to death. Amen. Look what it says right here. In Romans chapter 8 verse 13. We're still talking about putting it to death. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. Period. That's the word of God. Continue to go on and live your life that way. And see what it does to you. It will slowly steal from you. It will leach the life out of you. It will be a slow, painful death. He says, but if you through the Spirit, see, that's the good word right here. I'm not going to sit here. If I have ever preached the message of the cross in such a way to make you think that once you get a revelation of Calvary, that you're never going to have to make any decisions to walk in the right direction and that you're never going to feel a tug or a pull, that I preach this message to you completely wrong. Yes, whenever the Holy Spirit moves in and gives you a revelation, He will oftentimes make it easy. But if you think, if you're sitting around here waiting for you to get the victory before you come to a place where you're surrendered and you truly want God to do it and you're not willing to pull yourself away from what your flesh desires and wants, you're fooling yourself. I'm here to tell you, you're going to stay in the middle of that mess for a little while longer till God convinces you and you're willing to surrender to the will of the Lord. But once you do that, it's through the spirit that you do mortify your members. It's through the spirit that you do mortify the deeds of the body. You know, many times I've talked about this before, but when you get saved, it's kind of like this picture that we have of the stick man over here. This is Jesus, but now we're talking about you as an individual. Here we were talking about you as part of the church, right? We're talking about you as an individual, but over here, you were, you were born of Adam. You were born broken and dead, but when you put your faith in Christ and you were placed in him, the Bible teaches that you died with him and that you were resurrected in him. Now you're in Christ. What, I'm, okay, what does that mean? I mean, do, do you get what I'm trying to say? You can't see it. You can't fit it. It's almost like you just climbed up in him. The Holy Spirit, you didn't climb in him. The Holy Spirit put you in him. Amen. You were born like Adam and you used to do all the stuff that you used to do. But if you are truly saved, and that's between you and the Lord. I'm not the Holy Spirit here. If you are truly saved and you received it, well, I prayed a prayer in vacation Bible school. That's not what I'm talking about. I feel like with all my heart, the Lord put this on my heart, that the way that you truly know you're saved, Sister Tut used to say it all the time, you know that you know that you know that you know. You know what she was talking about? I believe this is what she was talking about, Ephesians 1.13. That when you respond to the gospel, everything changes. You get a down payment from the Holy Spirit implanted on the inside of you. The way you were yesterday is not the way that you are today. Now, I got... I got some, a little bit of some bad news for you. You could truly be saved and you could open up the door through disobedience and your conscience can become seared through sin to the point where sometimes you might even wonder, am I even really saved anymore? And I do believe that your salvation can come to the place of destruction. I believe that. 
But at the same time, I believe God wants to have a relationship with us a whole lot more than he wants to kick us out. Amen. God's not wanting to lock the door and kick us out. He's not. He's wanting to let us stay. And he's long-suffering, he's kind, he's merciful, and his ways are beyond our comprehension. It's the Holy Spirit that's got to do the work. Mm -hmm. And when you heard the gospel message, that old man that was born of Adam, he died in Christ. The Holy Spirit put him in Christ. Now he's been resurrected to newness of life. Guess what? You know what killed you? You know what killed the old man? Faith in Christ. Mm -hmm. You understand that? That was what you did. You believed. Yeah. Done. Amen. It don't get no more simple than this. Right. This is just the reality. What killed the old man was faith. Even though you didn't know it. No, but preacher, I didn't know that. I mean, the guy that told me about Jesus just told me, you know, told me about Jesus. Yeah, he might have mentioned the cross, but I didn't know that I literally died with him. Or, you know, I, I didn't know all that kind of stuff. Listen, it don't matter what you knew at that point. Because that was a spiritual miracle that happened. That's right. All you had to do was believe it. You didn't even understand everything. And all these words are coming at you. And the Holy Spirit starts dealing with your heart. And your heart starts beating. And you feel it. And it's like all of a sudden you're like, I believe what I'm hearing even though I don't understand it. A spiritual miracle happens. And the Holy Spirit is deposited on the inside of your heart. But listen, Colossians 2.6. Why don't you put that scripture up there real quick. <laughs> Colossians 2.6, what does it say? The same way that you received him, so shall you continue to walk in him. How did you receive Jesus? Through faith. Listen, the point that I'm trying to make is this, Jesus did the work. Yes. Quit, quit striving. No, start believing and start walking in the right direction, but you can't get it done. You can't make it happen. But the same way you received him through faith in him and what he did is the same way that you continue to walk in him. What are you talking about, preacher? I thought you were talking about mortifying the deeds of the body. That's what I'm talking about. Putting to death the deeds of the body through the Holy Spirit. How do I do that? I keep believing that what Jesus did was enough. Nothing else is going to do. Nothing else is going to work. Nothing else is going to get me through. Jesus died at the cross, and not only did he save me, but he gave me power to have victory over the works of Satan. And I'm going to keep on believing it until I experience it so that I can begin to walk in it. Because when I believe by faith, guess what happens? God starts to flow grace. That's right. It doesn't always happen as fast as you want it to. Because God knows something that you and I don't know. Or God knows something that the people on the side of us don't know. That we ain't really ready to surrender. Oh, we can put it on. But there's sometimes there's things in our life that we get frustrated with and we don't understand why it didn't go. Because you weren't really ready to surrender. Yeah. Still felt good to your flesh. You were still willing to hold on to it a little bit longer and sit it a little bit more and do whatever. Look at it a little bit longer. You get the point that I'm trying to hold hands with it. And the reality of it is, is that as long as you're willing to do that, God, God's in the business of convincing folks that what they want is him. Listen, he's not, he don't want robots, but he loves you enough to create situations and circumstances in your life to convince you that what you want is him. And that what you want to do is you want to walk with him and you want to live for him and you want to serve him. There's a revelation that is given from the Holy Spirit to the heart of the believer that shows him that he is not to live according to what serves himself and satisfies his flesh. Rather, he is to live his life according to the spirit in such a way that it brings glory to God. Boy, I just said a mouthful right there. Yes. Got to like bold in that. Hmm. That it brings glory to God. Your life on earth. Lord, help us. Lord, help the preacher. Your life on earth is supposed to bring glory to God. That means that the decisions that you make on a daily basis will either satisfy your flesh or bring glory to God. Mm. Amen. That's a good word. The world will not understand this. When we cross paths with the world and they realize that we no longer run with them, it causes astonishment. Remember that in that first part of that passage? They think it's strange 
that you no longer run with them. Wasn't that funny how we pointed out that in that passage of scriptures is all this Old Testament, I mean not Old Testament, Old English verbiage and then all of a sudden a word that would still be lived for us today. Why you don't no longer run with us? They think it's strange. They're astonished at the fact that you no longer live the way that they live. You know why? Because the world who don't know anything about the Bible and especially religious folk that don't really know anything about the Bible. Do you hear what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Were, were, you born, did, were you raised religious? Do you know people that were religious? Have you tried to talk to people that are religious? What are you talking about, preacher? I thought that we were religious. No. There's a difference between religion and having a relationship with God. Amen. There's a difference between people that are caught up in tradition and the lies that man has made religion look like versus what the Bible teaches about true Christianity. There's people that are going through the motions and the rest of the world. Listen to me. Don't get mad at me if you like going to Mardi Gras. I'm just using Mardi Gras as an example. All right. Okay. So I'm, what I'm here to tell you is this, is that the Bible teaches that you ought not live in revelry. You ought not live in lustfulness. You ought not live in drunkenness, right? I mean, I, dude, I can pull up at least four different passages in the New Testament to tell you not to do that. And at least one from Isaiah that says that they have song and wine in their party, but they have not the love of God. <laughs> All right. So I can prove from the scripture that this is God. But yet at the same time, we have religions that actually endorse Fat Tuesday to the point where you go out on Fat Tuesday and you live it up, baby. You revel. You do whatever it is that you want to do. And then the next day you go up in there and it never fails on Wednesday. I'm like, what you commit, dude? You need to wipe. You got something on your forehead. No, that's what we're going we to mourn. We're mourning now because we lived quite fat yesterday. And so now we're humbling ourselves and we're mourning. No, that's religion. That's religion that's contrary to the ways of God. God's not okay with us just going through the motions and acting like we're living for Him. And in reality, they don't even know the ways of God. What are you talking about? I'm talking about the fact that the world that's living knee-deep in sin and religion will not understand because everybody else is doing what they're doing. And then you come along and you don't do what they do. And they're going to think, who do you think you are? That's right. <laughs> The whole world's going this way. And we're supposed to believe that you're going the right way? Yep. But I didn't come up with it. It was written right here. You just chose not to believe. You never bothered to crack it open for yourself. I know I'm kind of a confrontational type preacher. I get it. You never bothered to crack it open for yourself and to read it, to learn it. To understand that it had a different pathway that it was describing. And instead, you just took what your mama told you, your mama's mama told you, your mama's mama's mama told you. You took the vain traditions of your people and you just went along according to what they said was right. And the reality of it is, is that hopefully one day you would have had a friend that loved you enough or a family member that loved you enough that got saved. That told, but they think it's strange. Why you don't? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. They think it's strange. Man, this is weird. You're weird. Yeah, well, look at what Peter said a little earlier in the same book, 1 Peter 2.9. He said, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Look at this. What I'm trying to say is this. This is the body of Christ, but it also represents a holy nation. Like you're a... You're, you're, I don't know how to describe it, you know, because we think of nations in a physical piece of land. If I had time, I'd go get my globe and I'd show you. You get the point, though. Physical pieces of land. This is the nation of Israel. This is the nation of the United States of America. This is the nation of Mexico. We think of physical. But no, we're talking about a spiritual nation Amen. that exists on the earth. And the thing that binds us together is not geographical boundaries, but it's the Holy Spirit living Hallelujah. on the inside of our heart. Right. It's what makes us different than everybody else. He says, you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You're a peculiar people. You're peculiar. You're strange. You're different than. You're set apart from. We think it's strange that you not run with us. Why are you so different? I'm trying to make a point. This is point number one. It's supposed to look different than the world looks. He says, 
a peculiar people. Why? Why does God want you to be peculiar? Look at this. That you would show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Listen to me. You're never really going to have a testimony until the Lord pulls you out of darkness. If you've ever been a prisoner to darkness and the Lord pulls you out and brings you into his marvelous light and you feel the weight of sin roll off your back and you feel the light, and you feel the, 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 the lightness, if you will, of God, because now you, you it's like his spirit is, is moving, is, is underneath your wings. He gives you, yeah, man, and he's lifting you up and he's giving you grace. Now you got something to talk about. That's right. He goes on to say in. 1 Peter 2.11, two verses later, he says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims to abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. As a new man in Christ, as part of the body of Christ, as being a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people, Peter implores us, don't do what the world does. Don't do what the world does. He said, if you do what the world does, there's a war that's taking that's going to take place in your soul. You know what the soul includes? You know, you want to know what the word soul actually. That's how you spell it. In the Greek. Suke. Look what look look all I gotta do is put one little. <laughs> psyche. That's where we get our word psyche from. It affects your mind. Your soul is your inner man that's in some way, shape, or form connected to both the world and God. When you engage in fleshly lust, you are allowing war to take place in the midst of your soul. It's warring on your mind, it's warring on your heart, it's warring on your inner man. The enemy is now at war with your soul. He's trying to destroy you. And at some point in time, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to wave a white flag. At some point in time, you're going to have to surrender to the way and the will of God. And if you refuse to do that, the war of your soul is going to continue to rage. Mortify, therefore, the deeds of the body through the Holy Spirit. How do I do that? Keep faith in Christ and what Christ has done and understand that God will give me grace to move in the right direction. But if I keep letting my feet bring me to the wrong place and all that other stuff, then now I'm just allowing war to continue on in my soul. Sometimes when we live different and abstain from fleshly lust, it will result that they will speak badly of us. At the same time, as Christians, sometimes we just make bad decisions. <laughs> Don't get them confused. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just trying to say, like, sometimes we over here taking per getting persecution, and it's, and it's not because we're, like, really consecrated to the Lord. We're making wrong decisions. Right. And it's not the same thing. That's right. When we make wrong decisions and we're being persecuted or we find ourselves in a trial, it's a different thing. That's where the correction's coming in from God. Point number two. There are some things that God expects of believers. Look at first. Well, I'm sorry, you don't have to look at it. But in 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11, Peter explains that the end is here. Remember we talked about that? That's why I drew the timeline. The end is here. Look, when Jesus came to earth and died on the cross and, and, caused, and it, it caused the Holy Spirit to come to earth, it was really the beginning of the end. The church age was birthed. God is bringing it. The day of Pentecost happened. I don't have time to get into the former and the latter rains, but it was preparing the soil up for the harvest of, of hearts. The Holy, he allowed the Holy Spirit to come to the earth in a completely different way, and now he lives in the heart of man, and the arrival of Jesus signaled the beginning of the end. The end days are upon us and we must be diligent to stay faithful to the work of God. Staying faithful to the work of God requires some things. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because we've already talked about it, but the Christian must be sober. You remember that? It wasn't talking about drunk with wine. It wasn't necessarily, to, although that could be part of it, but it's just not being drunk with sin in general because it blinds the eyes and it causes the feet to stumble and you can't hear right and you can't hear the voice of God. 
The Christian must be watching and in prayer. Listen, if you're drunk spiritually, you're not going to be watching and in prayer. I know because I'm a preacher and there's been times that I hadn't been watchful and in prayer like I'm supposed to be. I hope you're okay with that. I mean, not okay with it. You shouldn't be okay with it. What I'm trying to say is I hope you're okay with me being honest enough to tell you that. Amen. I mean, we're all human beings and we all fall short of the glory of God. Amen. But that doesn't make it okay. And we just wreak havoc in our own lives. The Christian is to be hospitable and not grudgingly. You're supposed to be kind and love one another. Even if they get on your nerves. <laughs> I need the Holy Spirit to help me with that one. Right? Lord, help me. I get frustrated. And a lot of times I realize it's my flesh that's doing it. Can I just be real with you? I mean, when I really stop and I start thinking sometimes at the times I've been frustrated, I'm like, you know what? That person loves God and I'm over here getting all frustrated. And you know what? They do. They're serving the Lord. They might not do everything the way I want them to do it. But guess what? Who am I? You, you get it? The Christian is supposed to treat others with love. The Christian has been given gifts by God and is to use those gifts to serve him. One of those gifts is speaking gifts. Listen, if you're going to speak the word of God, you're supposed to speak it. I'm, I'm, okay, God's called me to be a speaker of his word. You're supposed to speak it as though it's the oracle of God. You're a mouthpiece for God. You're not a mouthpiece for your own agenda. You know, a long time ago, God, when he first called me, he told me something whenever he was, whenever he was like grooming me to speak the word the way that he told me to speak the word. Some people don't like the way I speak the word, but I'm, not doing, I'm doing it the way that God told me to speak the word. One of the things that he told me, he said, man puts his grubby little fingers. That's how God speaks to me. He may not speak to you that way. Man puts his dirty, grubby fingers all up in my word. You know what he means by that is? He's got his own agenda. He's got his own agenda and he takes his grubby little fingers and he goes through my word and he tries to find text to say what he wants it to say. Get your grubby, dirty fingers out of my word. Let my word preach to my people. I've called you to be a mouthpiece. I, but they're my people. This is my word. And I'm here to feed them. Peter said, if you're going to speak, if you've been given a gift to speak, then you speak as though it's the oracle of God. That God is using you as a simple mouthpiece to speak forth his truth. Don't take away. Don't add to. Let God speak his word. And then he says service. He says, if you've been called to speak, speak as though it's the oracles of God. If you've been called to minister, then minister. Do you know what the word minister is where we get this word right here? Deacon. A servant. Stephen was a deacon. He was a servant, a diakonos. So what did he do? He was called to serve tables. Yes, God ended up using him to preach the gospel, but ultimately it was to serve. We're all called in one area or another. And the point is, is this, is that we're supposed to be giving our time to the Lord. We're supposed to give, be giving back to God. Amen. All right, that's, that's what I got for that second passage of Scripture. Now I'm closing. Give me five minutes. Expect the trials of life. That's point number three. Expect the trials of life. In that last passage of Scripture in verses 12 through 14, when the believer finds himself in a fiery trial, this should not be surprising. That's why I titled this morning's message, Why Are You So Surprised? Earlier in the same letter, Peter wrote about the fiery trial of our faith. Look at 1 Peter 1, chapter 3 through, I mean, verses 3 through 7. 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 7. Just bear with me. We got a little while longer. I know I'm a long-winded preacher. One day, maybe God will be done with me and you can hire somebody that preaches for 30 minutes. But until that day, I'm just going to speak the oracles of God. Amen. And we're going to love it because it's God's word. It says, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled. One thing I want to say right here is that word God has has begotten literally in the Greek text. It means he's given birth to you. Yeah, God is giving birth to a people that will serve him. 
He said, how did, how did he give birth to you? Through the resurrection. New life. It's new birth. It's new life. Later on in the text, he talks about the sprinkling of blood. It's the same old gospel story. The old man died through the... Listen, I don't have time to get an Old Testament sprinkling of blood right now. But it's a type of the cross. The old man dies. And because of that, a new man is able to resurrect to newness of life. And it brings new life. He says, resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God. Listen, let's just stop for a second. I know that I've used so many words already, but I want to say something. Do you, do you understand that a major part of Christianity is the belief that there's something to look forward to tomorrow? Do you understand that a major portion of Christianity is that you're probably not going to get every single thing that you want today. <laughs> that, do you understand that that's contrary to a lot of what is preached in the modern church? A lot of what is preached in the modern church regarding the word of faith doctrine teaches that you are like a little God and that you can confess and create into existence the life that you want. I do believe that there's power in, in life in, in, in the tongue. I do believe that we should have a positive confession because we are the children of God. But I do not believe that God has ever asked us to manipulate his word and to demand from him what we want on this earth. No, we are to live according to his demands and humbly submit to him and then watch him move in our lives. Amen. And let him promote us and let him give us the victory. Amen. Amen. But listen, there's, that's what's waiting for you. An inheritance that's incorruptible and undefiled that fades not away. It's reserved in heaven for you. You are kept by the power of God through faith and the salvation ready to be revealed in this last time. Wherein you greatly rejoice. You got something to rejoice about. Though for now, for a season. I just want to say this. That's temporary. You, through manifold temptations, I, I just, I, <laughs> everybody ever worked in the oil field before? Yes. <laughs> what is this? This is a manifold. What is the point? A pump is pumping liquid or fluid, and these are valves. And you know what? If you open a valve and you close a valve, it changes the direction of the flow of the fluid. Manifold means it's varied. It means it moves in, in various ways. The gifts of God are manifold. The moving of God is manifold. God will move in our way in our life in various ways. Sometimes the trials of life are manifold. They come at you from different directions. There's a variety of them. Listen, you have an inheritance that awaits for you. It's incorruptible. You have the hope of the God of glory. That, and he wants to pour his life into you. Even though now for a temporary season, you might find yourself in manifold temptations. In manifold trials. You might be getting hit all over the place. The devil might be digging you with multiple combinations. And you don't even know where it's all coming from. But I'm here to tell you that if you will serve him. If you will surrender to him and allow his Holy Spirit to work in your life, it's going to be temporary. Amen. Amen. It's going to be a season. Amen. Amen. And you have an eternal reward that's waiting for you. Amen. Yeah. You know, I just want to say real quick about trials. About trials or temptations. Listen, all temptations are always a trial. The nation of Israel, you can put Deuteronomy 8 2 up there real quick because I'm not going to turn to a lot of scripture right here, but. You know, the nation of Israel went through a trial for, for 40 years. I want you to see this. Look at this. Deuteronomy 8, 2. You shall remember all the way which the Lord your God led you these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you. See, we always think, man, Israel is supposed to be a 40-day no, a 40 journey, however the preacher said that. And it ended up being 40 years. <coughs> It's all Israel's fault. Well, it was Israel's fault to some extent, but at the same time, God allowed it. God uh, did, had a purpose in it. Why? Because he wanted to humble you. And he wanted to prove to you what was in your heart. Yeah. He wanted to put you to the test. To let 
you see what was in your heart, whether you would truly keep his commandments or not. In other words, whether you would truly walk with him or serve him. You're not a Christian just because you woke up one morning and said, oh, yeah, I, I, I'm going to be a Christian. No, your Christian faith is going to be tested. Israel was tested for 40 years. Jesus showed up on earth and he was tested for 40 days by Satan himself. Jesus showed up on earth and said, I am the son of man. I've been sent by the father to do the will of the father to bring in the new covenant so that you could have life. And Satan's like, oh, yeah, well, let's see how you handle this. And listen to me, the word of God says in the gospel of John also that to them who would believe, he gave us, talking about you and me, the power to be the sons of God. And if you're going to call yourself Christian in the New Testament, the word Christian is translated twice and it talks about one who is a follower of Christ. And if you're going to say that you're going to be a Christian, listen to me, it's bigger than you just at vacation Bible school raised your hand one day. You're going to be put to the test. The trial will come. Frustration will come. Amen. The Lord's going to prove you. He wants to show you what's in your heart. Real quick, and then I'm closing, I promise. <laughs> Three awesome. purposes of the trial, and then we close. Three purposes of the trial. Miss Gail's always encouraging. She always tells me, keep <laughs> preaching, preacher. <laughs> Three purposes of the trial. Pur purpose number one, the trial reveals impurities so that they can be recognized and removed so that the vessel can be used by the Lord. The trial reveals impurities so they can be recognized and removed so that the vessel can be used by the Lord. Look at Proverbs 25, 4. This is talking about something physical. It's talking about silver, but look. Take away the dross. You know what that's talking about? Refuse. The waste. Take away the dross from the silver and there shall come forth the vessel for the finer. That word finer there is not talking about a finer vessel. It's talking about the refiner. You heat up the fire on silver enough, it starts to melt and the impurities come to the top where it can be seen and it can be removed. And then now you have a pure vessel that's worthy to be. See, the refiner knows what's in that. The one who, he, it literally means a smelter. The person who puts the fire to the metal. He sees what's going on. He sees the impurities. He's the one that removed it. Now it's formed into a vessel. Yeah, I think I'll put that one over here on my shelf because I'm going to use that one because I know what's in it. He knows what's in it. The trial in your life, whenever it's heated up, I didn't come up with this stuff. The Lord did. And I sometimes don't like trials in my own life. As a matter of fact, I pretty much hate them. I know that that's not the right response. Paul said we glory in tribulation. Sometimes Matt's flesh is going crazy, dude. White knuckles, red knuckles, veins popping out. Like, Lord, help me! I'm so frustrated! Maybe he's trying to show me I got frustration in me. That's an impurity that needs to be removed. Right? Remove it. How? Mortify it through the Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. That was point number one. Point number two. This is what the trial will do. It produces Christian character. Amen. Look at Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 4. You see, you move enough draw sooner or later, you start actually looking like a Christian. <laughs> Amen? Amen? God's got a plan. It produces Christian character. We're going to get into this a little bit more deep when we get here in Romans chapter 5. But real quick, I just love this, so I'm going to talk about it. Look at what it says. Not only so, but we glory in tribulations. That's what I'm talking about, the mature Apostle Paul. Knowing that tribulation works patience and patience endurance. I, I, you know, it says experience, but the, real, the word is translated as endurance in other translations. And, ex, and experience or character and character hope. So right there for those two words, really and truly, for patience, the, a better translation would be endurance. And for experience, a better translation would be character. You know, I've talked about this before uh, many times, but that word for endurance right there is, is a compound word in the Greek. Just bear with me. Hupo mone, it's one word. Hupo means under, and mone means remain. 
Remain under the trial in a God-honoring way. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes you're faced with trials and tribulation, and you're like, oh, I'm preaching big, man. I'm a big old preacher when I get behind this pulpit. But look, sometimes don't think that the enemy's not like also t screaming in my ear. I know we're not supposed to hear the voice of a stranger. Don't mean you'll never hear it. You're never not supposed to submit to the voice of a stranger. But if he talks to me, I know good and well he's trying to talk to y'all. When you find yourself in the midst of trial and tribulation, let me tell you something. Sometimes the enemy wants to try to make you quit. Sometimes the enemy will speak to you and tell you, you just soon give up on this deal, dude. This thing is a mess. Hupo mone. Remain under the trial in a God-honoring way. You need to come out on the other side still serving the Lord, man. You can't just tuck and run. You just can't take your hands off of it and run in the opposite direction. No, you got to stay steadfast. You got to keep your eyes on the Lord. And whatever it is that you face, you got to be able to trust God that he's bigger than your situation. He's bigger than the storm that you're in the midst of. And that instead you're going to hold on to God and he will give you the strength that you need. <laughs> To remain and to continue. Amen. Amen. Listen, whenever you do that, when you're in the trial and you endure and you begin to remain under the trial and you receive the grace that you need and you come out on the other side, the word character is dokimai. I've shared this with y'all before and I don't really know a better illustration. I've shared it a lot of times. But back in the days of the New Testament, they had coins and the coins were made out of precious metals. And on those coins, what they would do is they would, they would clip the coins. They would shave off little pieces off the edge of the coin. And they would, it's kind of like a drug dealer. I mean, I'm not trying to get weird on you. If you don't know nothing about selling drugs, then you wouldn't understand this. But drug dealers will cut their stuff. They got heroin or cocaine. They'll cut it. I know that's kind of a weird illustration, but, it's a, but, it, but it makes sense. They'll cut it and then they'll add something else to it so that they increase their profit. That's basically what they were doing. They were clipping the precious metals off the coin, shaving it around the edges, and then they would save enough to where they could melt it down and get another coin. So they were just stealing off of the front end off of people and giving them, they were basically <coughs> ripping them off. But what happened was, was that through time, whenever people, people started to build a reputation, and whenever you, you would go to now, somebody would have the reputation of a doki mai. His character was tried and true. When you give him this amount of value, he's going to give you that value in return. When the Christian goes through the trial in a God-honoring way, it begins to produce in him a character that is tried and true by the will of God. And that now, as that Christian begins to live his life, guess what ends up happening? What he says of himself the Bible also says of himself, it's all by the grace of God. It's all by the grace of God changing him. And through the trials of life, through the word of God, through the Holy Spirit, doing that work on the inside of him so that he can be a proven servant of the Lord. That's point number two. The trial produces Christian character. Lastly, and I'm closing, the trial brings correction. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7. It says if you endure chastening, you know what the word chasten means? It means to be brought, correction is brought to you, but it, in, it also involves instruction. A long time ago, the Lord dealt with my heart because I just felt like I was just a man. Look, I believed in whipping. I don't know if that was, I, I know it's the right thing to do because the Bible says to do it. But I know that there were times I was like, man, I don't do nothing but whip these kids, bro. And you know what the Lord showed me? First, he said, don't grow weary and well-doing, number one. Number two, my word speaks much more about instruction than it does discipline. You need to do your job as a father. One of the things that, and I'm not saying that I did everything right because I know that I didn't, but one of the things that the Lord really put in my heart was that I was supposed to instruct them and explain to them the ways of God and why they were supposed to do what they were supposed to do. And then one of the things that I realized is, is that after they didn't do what I had already instructed them in, now they were being rebellious. They knew what was right. They were just choosing to go the wrong way. So that's what it means to be chastened. It means to receive correction, discipline, but also to receive instruction. There's a nurture aspect of it. You're building them up. You're feeding them. You're, you're, you're encouraging them. He says, if you endure chastening, God deals you with as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chastens not? Listen, 
Have you ever been in a situation where it don't seem like anything at all is going right for you? I'm just like, I'm talking about after you've been a Christian or even before you were a Christian. Many times God will allow those things to happen in your life to draw you to him. And then once you're walking with him, he'll allow those things to happen again to make you to break you and to surrender you because you're not doing what there's certain things that he's trying to speak to you. God deals with you as son for what son is he whom the father chastens not. He loves us enough to chasten us. Hebrews 12, 11, No chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. Do you not hate it whenever you get disciplined? I mean, is there, is there not something in your flesh that doesn't like to receive correction? I mean, I'm just saying, like, sometimes we can correct one another as brothers and sisters in the world. And I know there's a right way to do it, but sometimes... There's things that people tell me that's the truth, and I don't like it. Yep. I might want to try to blame it on the way that they did it, but the reality of it is, I just don't like it. <laughs> Lord, help us. Help our rebellious attitude. How are we going to learn anything like that? Now, no chastening seems to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them but you're exercised thereby. That's an interesting word, gymnazo. It's where we get the word gym, gymnasium from, and it literally talks about the training of the athlete, the training of the body. It talks about it was used in the Grecian, in the Greek world of all these athletes. You know, it's where the Olympics come from, and daily being trained. But it's talking about it from a spiritual perspective. God's chastening, God's discipline, God's instruction. Those that allow themselves to endure the correction of the Lord, they're being trained by it like an athlete would train his body to become fit. And at some point in time, it starts to, you see changes. Just like you can see changes in your body, and they call that in, in, in fitness recomposition. You can see the body literally change spiritually as you are exercised by the correction of the Lord. Amen. You will begin to see changes in your life.